Okay. All right. We are interviewing Rob, Robin Pierre, who is running for election as U.S. Senator. Uh, please feel free to give us an introduction. You have two minutes. Okay. I guess I'll give my origin story why I'm running. Uh, I had a baby born on election night 2020, and it was a beautiful, wonderful distraction from the chaos that ensued from that election night. So for about 30, month, 30 days, I was on uh, parental leave with a newborn, but completely isolated in a bubble, unaware what was going on in the outside world. I didn't know if Trump won or Biden won. Then 30 days later, I go to work. It's Monday, January 5th, normal day. Then it's the next day, Tuesday, January 6th, and the attack on the Capitol insurrection event occurred. And my mind melted. I could not <clears throat> map what happened from election night to the uh, in insurrection horde invading the Capitol. Uh, I understand everybody else was mostly living this uh, shit show shenanigan that happened in between nightmare scenario that built up to it. I was again with a newborn and I was in a bubble. And from that, I spent the next three months uh, analyzing and studying what was caught. How did we get there from point A to point B? And about two, three months studying this, I, I realized, wow, we have about 10 plus members already elected into Congress who are full on QAnon members. And that just horrified me to, to, act, to act. And I wanted to get involved. So I thought about what are the things I could do? I could volunteer, donate. And then I noticed that, hey, there's an upcoming Senate election and Patty Murray was up for her sixth term. And um, I thought, well, no, I, I want to try. I want to do my best and, you know, try to push the needle. And that's why I decided to get involved. I'm seconds. running. Pardon me? 10 seconds. Oh, so yeah, I want to run. I'm running for this position to go to where the event happened and be a defender for our freedoms and uh, be a progressive, uh, uh, how do you call it? A progressive a leader in that, in that uh, regard. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. <clears throat> We hate to interrupt you. We're just trying to keep make sure it's um, the yeah. same for all the candidates. Um, so um, we have uh, four prepared questions. Again, you've got two minutes to answer each one of these. Uh, Alice, do you want to take that first question? And sure. again, you can see these, Robin, you can see these in the chat as well. Oh, cool. Okay. After decades of declining crime rates, many of America's most successful cities are seeing surges in crime fueled largely by guns. What work have you done in the Senate or would you do in the Senate to implement gun reform and work to end the gun violence crisis? And what will you do if elected? Uh, so I, I'm all for major gun reforms and protections to help alleviate the, especially like mass shootings that has just been plaguing the country uh, and rising numbers. Uh, the thing that we need to realize that uh, there's this hardships of dealing with the people who are so pro-gun that they don't even want to have a conversation. And I kind of have this um, nuanced approach after taking a, uh, what do you call it, a John Hopkins uh, master's course on reducing gun violence. And the one approach that I have to talk to them is to address something that's considered the elephant in the room is the uh, what do you call, the white male suicide problem, about 40,000 gun deaths happen per year, about 22,000 is that. So that's kind of my, my uh, wedge to start the, uh, a conversation with the, the hardcore gun uh, legislatures is start with that and then kind of egress to start, hopefully gain enough trust with them to talk about the mass shootings uh, or like uh, assault rifle bans and whatnot. So but um, it, it was something that just came to me when, when I was taking that course. And I thought, wow, if I just go in hardcore, like, oh, I'm just going to talk about stuff they don't want to talk about. They're just going to be shut off from wanting to communicate with me. So I, I hope I answered that as well as I could. But and I do recommend taking that John Hopkins uh, gun, uh, gun, uh, gun violence reduction course. It's taught by gun owners and non-gun owners. And they're like one of the foremost groups uh, offering this kind of research and to uh, gun safety and uh, violence mitigation. So. Great, thank you. Right. Uh, question number two, Sherry, do you want to take that one? Um, 
What would be the most effective way to roll out the proposed expansion of broadband under the American Rescue Plan? Is this the high speed internet to rural areas? I believe so. Oh, yes. So that is um, the most effective way to roll it out. I'm not sure who's opposing it, probably just the, the big tech, uh, not the, the big uh, high speed internet companies, the cable companies may have some resistance. So the best way to approach it is first you need to um, reach out to the rural areas and make them understand, or at least they probably already know this, that high speed internet access is a, should be regarded as a utility. And it, it hinders their economic growth in those areas. And we, I think once they, they have a consensus around, hopefully they, they understand that, the idea is that they need to also work to push local government and federal government effectively so that they don't get pushed back by the, the big corporations who don't want to roll this out, as I understood, who are the resistance to this. Um, but if the government's going to be paying a large billion dollar subsidy to make this happen, I don't know who would be resisting from this from happening. The only drawback that could be is like, uh, uh, what do you call it, so, um, uh, infrastructure or at least like other things that could prohibit it, like access to rural roads and other um, like rural rules in this situation or like uh, municipality rules that might hinder that, that was pre-written to uh, block that. So um, that's the best I could think of right now. But um, the idea is that I think we can get everybody on board who live in the rural areas who desperately need this access for economic growth. Um, I think that's all I can say for right now. So, but I think it's a wonderful plan. And yeah, it's uh, we are, we're kind of behind on having full access internet to everyone in this country compared to other countries around the world. Great, thank you. Um, Clayton, do you wanna take question number three? Sure. Um, if I can find it, um, you see that in the chat? Yes. Climate change legislation. Uh, okay. Yeah. On the federal level, um, there has been a failure to enact comprehensive climate legislation that curbs climate emissions. What will you do to ensure that the federal government is leading in the fight against climate change? The big resistance to this is uh, the the big corporations that are have bought certain politicians, particularly oil companies, uh, and the one I have a very odd idea is that um, if there is a some way to get the pe American people to be publicly educated, whenever a particular politician is on national television, there would be uh, a superimposed images of, like if Mitch McConnell went on, I guess C-SPAN or CNN immediately a but like um, a little bubble would pop up and say, well, he's being paid off by Exxon in real time. So it's similar to like what sporting events have like uh, superimposed live images and stats of the players. Well, I would like that to be put uh, put in place so that they could, um, the American public would see the politician talk and realize, oh, that person's bought by big oil. That's terrible. And they're constantly reminded about that. That's just one kind of radical idea I've had going about this. Uh, the other thing is um, there's there's like carbon taxes that they're, they're well-intended, but there's also some kind of uh, negative consequence of doing that where some companies decide, oh, well, I, I could just pollute and just pay the fee or pay the fine. So that's very troublesome. But the thing is that tr trying to get everybody on board uh, with different incentives and whether or not they're very in bad faith if they want to help uh, improve our environment, which is super critical because things are not going very well as our temperatures are, are increasing and our sea levels are rising. Um, so the thing the federal government, I hope that when we have the right, the Democrats, they have the White House and, and the Senate and the House that we just wield the power that we currently have and don't be complacent about it. Unlike the conservatives, when they're in power, they just push whatever terrible uh, plans they have, even if they, it's not popular with the public or in the best interest of everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Thank <laughs> you. Um, Barbara, do you want to take question number four? Sure. Um, how do you 
respond to the threat of Roe versus Wade being overturned at the federal level? And how will you ensure continued equitable access to abortion and reproductive health care? Okay. So first, my stance on abortion is that abortion is health care. It is a private medical matter between a woman and her doctor. Uh, outside opinions, uh, opinions outside of the medical examination rooms are relevant. No exceptions. Um, that said, um, the problem I see at what's going right now, considering that the Supreme Court has had that leaked document, um, I'm a big proponent of term limits for Congress and also the Supreme Court. So um, the threat right now can't really be imposed by term limits, but this is kind of a long-term idea that if I think the first, the next branch of the uh, government that could have term limits implicated if the Democrat side of, of Congress can push through is make that happen so that uh, it allows generational uh, Supreme Court justices who could fit, stick with the times, they, they would fit with the times that they were present, not just be sit, sitting on the bench forever. And hopefully they, they don't make any big changes, but this is a very, very shocking and drastic situation that's just happened, but it shouldn't be shocking because they were built the, this was being built up over the decades to the point that uh, when it finally hit us in the face, we were all, we we're all shocked, but that's not, that shouldn't be the issue. So, uh, but equitable, equitable access is super important. Uh, I am disappointed that there's like some kind of uh, stipul uh, restrictions on how government spending is on abortion. I heard it was like a very low percentage or it was depending on the state and the federal negotiations. Uh, but I think that we should expand it and make it just abortion be part of healthcare. It's not, it shouldn't have, have any special uh, problems or special situ uh, um, agreements on that. It's just the definition is getting, it, it deserves better attention. So. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. <clears throat> the questions from the e-board. Again, you've got one minute to answer these. Um, and uh, does anyone have uh, questions to start off here? Yeah, Barbara. Um, I have a question. I'm going to try to um, state it succinctly. And it's a follow on to the Roe v. Wade question and also your statement that you were concerned about members of QAnon uh, appearing it, you know, at the federal level as elected officials. So um, you meant you discussed, um, I would say, uh, what I would call hardening the democratic institution of the Supreme Court by instituting term limits, which is actually um, I, I believe, I, uh, I commend you for that. And I wonder what other kinds of democratic, shall we say hardening, or, or uh, I invite you to share with us some other ideas which would harden or uh, shore up our democratic institutions about this, uh, against this incursion of what we call now QAnon. Uh do you want me to talk about the Supreme Court? Part? You can talk about anything you oh, want. Okay. I'm, inviting, I'm inviting you to um, extend that thinking to uh, other um, institutions, sure. you know, at sort of at risk, vulnerable institutions that you sure. may have thought about. Um, for the QAnon part, uh, a couple months ago, there was a situation where uh, Dr. Fauci. Uh, called under, under a hot microphone, uh, somebody who's one of the, I think it was a senator from uh, Missouri, he called him a moron because he just kept hammering him with questions that were just totally in this stray direction. And um, the person I, can, I the person that's sitting at the head of the committee of that event uh, was Patty Murray. And she didn't like, you know, she's the head of that, uh, Senate committee, she could have just laid the hammer down and say, hey, stop asking stupid questions. This is, but that didn't happen. Uh, that's just a, one example. Uh, just be confrontational with them because they, they, the QAnon folks, they just, they have a lot of bravado. They just, they'll just, they're, they're just going to go forward, push, regardless of how stupid they may look. Uh, 
the other thing um, for Supreme Court, so term limits is one idea. The other Second. one is, um, what do you call it? Packing the Supreme Court, which is super, it shouldn't be super controversial because there isn't really a lot of history on doing that, but the con constitution doesn't say we can't do it. It's just, I see a lot more resistance going that path than term limits for Supreme Court. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Laura, you have a question. Sure, thank you. Um, how specifically do you think you can be more effective um, than the incumbent? Uh, so the two things that I'm offering differently is, uh, one is I'm trying to come up with a legal framework where I would self-impose a term limit contract with the state of Washington uh, with the leadership with either Jay Inslee or the attorney general or secretary of state where the contract basically says, hey, um, I'll serve a senator max two terms. If I violate that, I am ready to go to prison. It's a very radical idea because I thought term limits all go in and try to legislate that, but there's so much internal inertia. I thought let's do something really creative and, and new. See, I, I, I don't even know the, the constitutional merits of it, but I wanna propose that to the public saying, hey, we should try something. Because if we don't try anything, we're, we're just gonna be stuck where we are. The second thing is, um, so if police, if police officers have to wear body cams, I want to be the first politician. I'll wear a body cam so that we could uh, uh, live stream record any interactions with lobbyists because I want more transparency with that. Great, thank you. Okay. Um, we have time for one more question. This is a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm not coughing. I, just getting over COVID, so. Yeah, that's right, that's right, yeah, you mentioned that. Yeah, yeah, Clayton, you have a question. Yeah, um, uh, it's it's a kind of uh, uh, meat and potatoes traditional question. Could you tell us something more about your background, where you're from? Oh, sure, I grew up in Everett, Washington, and uh -huh. I'm the parent of, my parents are two immigrants, one from Haiti, one from Madagascar. They were pen pals for 20 years, pre-internet, which, it was amazing. <laughs> um, so the joke story I like to say uh, from my, my father was aircraft mechanic at Boeing. Then I worked at I worked at Boeing. My wife works at Boeing. Uh, my sister is an aircraft mechanic at um, Alaska Airlines. So all these people surrounding my mother work in aerospace airplanes, and she hates to fly. So <laughs> uh, I've been at Boeing 16 years. Started aerospace, kind of transitioned to the data scientist realm of the job. Uh, saved the company $16 million once. And then I got a layoff notice, which was, it was really hilarious. I don't No, I still was able to keep my job. I just had to go find a new group to work for, but it was kind of strange. Um, I've been mentoring uh, various students from the University of Washington Seconds. between Boeing for years on how to get jobs in STEM. And I also believe that uh, we should have more STEM representation in Congress. So uh, it's a very abysmal number. I think there's only 16 out of 700 people who went through Congress since 2016 who have a STEM degree. So, yeah. Great, thank you. Perfect, you have one minute to make a closing statement. Oh, okay, closing statement. Um, let me think about this. Uh, I'm pro-union, so I, I think that we should have more union representation, especially I heard the union staffer, uh, Capitol Hill staffers are not union and they're trying to push to do that. So I think that's also important. It's kind of strange that not a lot of legislators are on board with that, even like Nancy Pelosi, which is, she says she's pro-union, but she's not supporting this in, in her own house. So um, the other things are like police reform, uh, qualified immunity and prosecutor, prosecutor, ah, prosecutorial immunity needs to, we need a drastic overhaul with the police and demilitarization and their budgets. And um, so, and the other thing is like um, American, America is gradually gonna legalize weed apparently. Well, let's we'll see if the Supreme Court blocks that, but we need to retroactively free the people who are still sitting in prison while in different states we're, we're letting weed become legal. Um, trying to think of anything else. I have my notes, I'm just going quickly. Um, 10 seconds, I guess that's it. I mean, the last thing is uh, high frequency stock trading needs to be taxed heavily. So that, that, that way uh, I did a calculation we could pull in an extra 700 to $1.2 trillion without, Thanks. oh, sorry, affecting no, the fine. workers. So, okay. 
we always hate cutting cutting you off. We <laughs> want to be equitable for everybody, um, you know, playing by the same rules. But I, Robin, we thank you so much for coming down and uh, being part of our uh, Zoom meeting here, and thank you for uh, taking the time to do it. And, okay. Uh,